So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. Um, if it's the first time you've been at a webinar, um, we're really delighted to have you here. And if you're already a veteran of these webinars, welcome back. Um, so my name is Mairead and I'm currently in Galway in the west of Ireland. Um, if you have good speakers on your computer, you will probably hear the rain <laughs> beating on the window. Um, we have a pretty bad day here today, as, as is pretty typical for January. Um, so as I said, my name is Mairead and um, I've been teaching for nearly 20 years now. Um, I've been lucky enough to um, live in a lot of different countries and teach a lot of different students of all nationalities, ages, circumstances. Um, so hopefully today I'll be able to share um, some of what I've learned along the way with you um, as you all embark on your teaching career. Um, so today um, our topic is creating and adapting teaching resources. Okay, um, I think this will be really, really helpful for you all because as teachers, um, you know, we are just constantly thinking, okay, what, uh, what material am I going to use? Am I going to use the course book? Am I going to change what's in the course book? Am I going to do something entirely different? Um, so today we're going to explore um, all of the, uh, the different permutations around the material that we use. Um, so let's go, let's jump straight in. Um, as I said, when it comes to choosing material for our students, um, you know, a couple of questions might pass through our heads. Um, we might think, okay, will I search for suitable materials myself? Um, will I do this online or will I use books, resource books, textbooks? Um, will I create my own material from scratch, like completely from zero? Uh, or will I adapt something that I already have? Okay. Or another option could be, um, do I recycle something that I already have? Yeah, maybe, you know, maybe you made an activity a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago and you think, OK, let's revisit. Yeah, so maybe you might use the material that you created or um, you might make some adaptations. Yeah, you may change it to suit whatever class you're teaching at that time. Um, so, you know, we typically have these questions running through our minds. OK, do I use what I have? Do I create something new? Do I change something existing? Um, yeah, it's a constant process. It's um, a teacher's mind is always a busy mind, I find. Um, when it comes to deciding what material to use, whether to adapt or create, um, here are some points to consider. Um, you might ask yourself, how much do I know about the subject that I'm teaching? Um, like if you're teaching a specific grammar point, for example, um, do you feel comfortable creating something from from scratch? Or would you prefer the security maybe of taking something already created? Yeah, so you know, how much we know about the topic can definitely play into our decision. Um, of course, you've also got to consider what do my students need to learn? Um, you know, if you have an existing piece of material, um, does it serve the purpose you need it to serve? Yeah, maybe it doesn't because each group we teach, right? They have different um, different needs, different gaps in their knowledge. So sometimes it's not as easy as just picking up something that you used last month, because maybe that was with a different class with different needs. Okay. Um, you've also got to consider, um, will my students like this material? Will they be interested? Okay. Um, as I said just previously, does, you know, will it meet their needs? Um, will it fill the gaps in their knowledge? Um, you can consider what resources you already have, okay? Is there anything um, that you've used in the past or that you've made in the past that you could bring back with maybe some minor tweaks? Um, of course, super importantly, you've got to consider the language level, okay? Um, you know, maybe you had an amazing activity that worked really well for a B2 group and you're desperate to use it again but it turns out it's just too difficult. You know, you couldn't use it for a B1 group, for example, because even though the activity is excellent, it would be too difficult. So what you can do then is just maybe adapt it, maybe grade it down a little, and you can still use the basic uh, the basic premise of your material, but have to regrade it. 
Okay. And finally, you know, you'll have to take into um, account the demographics of your group. Yeah. Is the material age appropriate? Is it culture appropriate? Okay. Um, because again, we can have the most amazing materials, but if it doesn't suit the group, it's not worth using, okay, without, without adaptations. Um, so lots of things. As I said, a teacher's mind is a busy mind. All of these things are going through your mind as you're, as you're um, choosing what materials to use or create or adapt, okay? You've got to think about so many aspects. All right. Um, I'm just taking a look at your messages, guys. Wow, we have a great spread of people today. So, hey, Kathy, welcome back. And hey, Pam, welcome. <laughs> great to see you here. Okay, we have Zimbabwe, UK, Canadian, and Mexico. Oh, my goodness, we're, we have got a wonderful spread here today. Um, we have lots of Canadians. Awesome. Love to see it. Um, and Hatis, yes, I remember your name, Hatis. Welcome back. And Kate in Maine. Ah, oh, welcome. <laughs> I hope uh, I hope you're going to enjoy your very first webinar. Um, all right, and South Africa in the house also, and the US. Fab. Oh, that's so exciting. Really good to see you all, guys. Um, so there we go then. They are just some of the many questions to consider when choosing material. Um, but of course, there are some other factors too we need to um, consider. Um, are we teaching an online class or is it a face-to-face -face class? Um, this is a huge consideration when it comes to material um, because as you can imagine, um, tasks or material that would work really well when you're in front of your students and you can hand out pieces of paper and you can stick up pictures on the wall, etc., cetera, um, might not necessarily work in an online class. Yeah, so this is a huge consideration. Um, when you choose your material, just think logistics, like how is this going to work? All right. Um, another consideration um, could be the whole issue around copyright. Yeah, um, especially when we're taking stuff from the internet. Um, so if you see like an amazing picture or image, for example, that you want to use, you know, you've got to check is it copyright free? Yeah. Or I think um, the term is creative commons. Yeah. Does it have a creative commons license? Can you use it um, legally? Yeah. Um, later on, I'll be giving you lots of websites for um, images that are creative commons licensed. Um, you know, just so you don't um, inadvertently get yourself into trouble by using something that is copyrighted. Okay. Um, Another thing to think about is whether you want to use authentic material. Yeah, that would be material that isn't graded for language learning. It's just out there in the English speaking world, like um, the Independent or the Sunday Times or, you know, a BBC podcast, for example. Um, so do you want to use something authentic? Do you want to use something semi-authentic, which is... Um, you know, it was originally authentic, but you've made some modifications just to make it easier. Yeah. Or do you want to use um, material that is especially created for language learners? OK, you know, it, it's not authentic out there in the English speaking world, but it's it's been constructed just for learners. OK, so things to think about. Right. Um, also, You've got to consider really carefully the cost of um, the material, especially if you're subscribing to a to a resource website. Yeah, um, you know, there are tons of websites out there where you can buy resources, but, you know, they might have a weekly subscription. They might have an annual subscription plan. Yeah, you might be able to pay on a one off basis. Um, you know, so you've got to consider the cost if you decide to go down the subscription route. And you've also got to think about your time management. OK, like, is it, you know, is it worth you? Is it worth your while spending maybe one hour creating an amazing task that will only last 10 minutes? Yeah, um, this is probably one of the biggest problems I had 
when I was creating materials. Um, you know, I used to spend hours making this amazing activity, but then the activity would be over in 10 minutes, you know? Um, so I quickly learned, you know, spend time on the longer activities. Yeah, on the activities that are going to take like 20, 30 minutes. Okay, and try not to spend so much time on the shorter ones. Yeah, so, you know, always think about your own time management. You know, you've got to work smart. <laughs> okay, spend the time on creating or adapting materials that will buy you a lot of time in the classroom. All right. Um, when it comes to creating or adapting materials, um, you've really got to try and make sure that the materials are engaging and interactive, okay? We want to make sure that they encourage some sort of interaction or, you know, that they have scope for becoming interactive, okay? Um, are you in a position where you can use realia, okay? Can you bring in um, real life objects, yeah, to support your tasks and to support your material? Um, is there any technology required? Okay, for using your your material that you've created or adapted. Um, if you do need technology, yeah, to support your material, um, always make sure that you have a backup plan just in case that technology fails, um, because it will be the one time that it happens. All right. Um, so yeah, think carefully. Is technology required? And if so, what will I do if it doesn't work? <laughs> All right, it's super, super important. Um, think as well about the type of materials. Yeah, um, I know when I started teaching, um, I would just think that materials means worksheets. <laughs> okay, um, but that is not necessarily the case. Worksheets are just a, a very small part of uh, what materials can be. Um, so we can find um, printed material, online material, interactive, yeah, videos, podcasts, etc., visuals, um, media resources. All right. So, you know, try not to get um, too short sighted on what materials are. OK, they are not just worksheets and handouts. OK, they can be any, any number of things. OK. Um, so we have some examples here then of what might constitute resources or materials. Um, we could have, of course, our, our ubiquitous worksheets, but also newspapers. Um, if you're working online, um, you might go down the, the route of using interactive worksheets. Um, I'll be telling you about a really good website later that can convert pretty much any type of worksheet into an interactive online drag and drop or matching activity. Yeah. Um, visuals. Yeah. You can use pictures, photos, artwork. Yeah. Always trying to make sure that they are copyright free. OK. And that you are allowed to use them. Um, media resources such as blogs, YouTube, uh, movie clips, songs, podcasts. OK. Um, you know, there's a vast, vast range out there of things that we can use as resources in the classroom. Um, when it comes to using online resources, um, I have to say, everyone, that you have got to be super, super careful when you're selecting your websites. OK, um, I know when I started teaching back in the day, um, I used a lot of online resources because, you know, it was faster. I felt more secure <laughs> with my lack of experience using um, pre-made material. Um, you know, I might go online, search for an activity for practicing the present perfect. I'd find one and I'd think, excellent, print and photocopy. And this is what we're doing tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I assumed that just because it was online on a teaching website that, you know, it was OK. But then to the horror, yeah, to my horror, when I'd be doing the, the handout in class, I might notice some typos. I might notice some sentences that were really bad examples of the present perfect. OK. And yeah, I would just, you know, as I was, as students were doing the, the handout, I'd be thinking, oh, wow, I really wish I hadn't just assumed that this would be fine. OK. 
So when you're taking materials from the internet, just proofread them, proofread them, proofread them. Okay, make sure that they're accurate. Make sure that they're doing what you want them to do. Okay, um, make sure that the um, content that you've taken from an online source is suitable for your class. Yeah, make sure that there's nothing hidden in there that might offend or that might confuse or that might trouble your students. Um, again, coming back to the copyright issue. Yeah, make sure that you're actually allowed to use the material. Yeah, that it's not under copyright. Um, as I said before, if you use a subscription um, website for teaching resources, um, just, you know, make sure you know how much it's costing you. Yeah, like, like I said before, is it a once off fee? Is it an annual fee? Yeah, we don't want to sign up for anything that might become a bit of a drain <laughs> on our bank accounts unknown to ourselves. Okay, and also when you're choosing online resources, um, ask yourself, do I need to edit this? Okay, you know, is it okay as it is or do I need to edit it? Because if you go down the route of having to ch make lots of changes and lots of editing, you know, that can take a really long time. And it might actually be that it would be quicker for you to just make your own material. Yeah, sure, you can take inspiration from the online one. Yeah, but it might be just quicker for you to open up Word and just, or Canva and just whip up a worksheet yourself. Okay, so, you know, we don't want to waste too much time adapting something when it would be quicker for us to just make our own. All right. Um, more things to think about when it comes to online resources. Um, a lot of interactive sites, um, you know, all of those like interactive grammar quizzes, etc. cetera, um, they tend to be self-grading. So, you know, the students can see, yeah, if they've got their answer right or wrong, you know, that can save us a lot of time. Um, if we have our students do an online grammar quiz, for example, that is not self-graded, um, you know, that can eat a lot into our time um, having to go through each question and correct them. Okay, so consider that. Is it self-graded? If so, brilliant. Just check in advance that all of the answers are correct <laughs> because sometimes, uh, yeah, they can throw up some surprising answers. But if it's self-graded, excellent. If not, consider how you're going to do the feedback. Are you going to go through everything one by one? Um, what I used to do in this case, I would um, prepare the an answer key in advance, okay? And I would just forward the link to my students and say, okay, take two minutes, um, look at the answers, check them against your answers and ask me if you have any questions. Yeah, so a prepared answer key can save lots of time. Um, if students have done like a, a, a pretty long grammar quiz. Okay, um, another thing to bear in mind when using online resources is availability. Um, as you all know on the internet, broken links are everywhere, okay? And, you know, that can be pretty problematic. Um, so maybe, you know, you used a link two weeks ago and it worked perfectly. Uh, so you assume, okay, I'm going to use that link for another class today. Um, but then the class click into the link and hey, presto, not found. Okay, 404, <laughs> site not found. Um, so, you know, if you are using um, a link that maybe you haven't used in a couple of weeks, just always check in advance, make sure it's still there. Yeah, make sure it's still working. Um, and if it isn't there, you know, at least you'll have time to go find an alternative and you won't be in the horrible position of, of your students just, so teacher is not working and you're expected to come up with a solution on the spot, okay? We never want to be in that position. So check everything in advance. Um, you know, anything you do use um, with your classes that worked really well, keep a list. Um, I have an Excel spreadsheet. Okay, that's going back maybe 10, 15 years of all of the good, um, all of the good stuff that I've used in class. Uh, maybe it's just a link to a video. Maybe it's a link to a um, to a, an online um, reading activity. Okay, maybe it's a song. Yeah, 
but you know, whenever I use something, I put it in my spreadsheet, um, copy and paste in the URL, and then just beside it, give a brief description. Like this is, or I use this song for practicing the present perfect, okay? Or this is a great video for practicing the passive. Yeah, um, make sure as well that you pop in what level you used it with, yeah. And if you made any worksheets or anything, you know, link to that too. So that in your spreadsheet, you know, you have everything. And over the years, you will be amazed at the, at the collection of material that you can build up yourself. Um, on your laptops too, you know, scan everything. You know, scan everything, describe everything, okay? And you'll find after a few years, you actually don't need to plan many new activities because you already have such a, such a great wealth. Okay. And as I said before, um, if, well, if you're doing online, if you're using online resources or teaching online, um, doing anything that involves technology, yeah, always have a backup plan just in case things um, go a little pear-shaped. All right, you know, technology is amazing until it isn't. Okay, so we've always got to have our backup plan. All right. So now let's take a moment to talk specifically about authentic materials. Um, so as I said before, authentic materials um, were not created for teaching English. Okay, they were not created especially for students. Um, instead, authentic materials are um, things that are out there in the English speaking world. Okay, maybe TV programs, yeah, maybe newspapers, maybe blogs, okay, maybe podcasts. Okay, um, so they're materials that were not created um, for students, they were just um, created um, for um, speakers of English as a first language. Okay, um, so authentic materials are amazing to use in the classroom. Yeah, they're, they're really fantastic. Um, students tend to love authentic materials because, you know, they're getting a, a chance to practice with like real <laughs> non-graded English. Okay, um, so when we want to use them, um, there's lots of things for us to consider just to make sure that, you know, we don't terrify our students by giving them stuff that's too uh, difficult or too inaccessible for their level. Um, so the first thing we want to do is um, have our aim very, very clear, okay, for the class. Um, what will students know or be able to do at the end of the lesson? Okay, so we don't want to just do something because it's fun. Yeah, we want to do it because, well, hopefully it's fun, but mainly because it's teaching them something. Okay. And they will be able to do something better at the end of the lesson than they were at the beginning. Okay, so always start, what do I want to achieve in this class? Um, then you select your theme or your context. Okay. Um, so whatever, maybe it's something based on sports, maybe it's something based on travel, yeah? Whatever context you feel will best serve your aim. Um, then we can go searching for stuff, okay? We can select our appropriate resource, yeah? Um, that will be suitable for the class. Um, again, bearing in mind the age, the level, etc., and bearing in mind our aims and objectives, okay? Um, then when we found our piece of authentic material, yeah, be it a blog, be it a video, be it a song, yeah, be it a newspaper article, um, ask yourself, does this resource need to be adapted? Okay, is it too long? Yeah, am I going to shorten it? Yeah, um, is some of it unclear? Um, in which case, will I just remove an entire paragraph? Yeah. Um, do I think that students would benefit from an image or more images here? Well, yeah, sure. Let me go find some images um, that will help, you know, that will help them to visualize the context a bit better. Um, so it's a pretty common that we will need to do some, some adaptations, such as lengthening, shortening, adding, yeah, taking away, adding images. Yeah. Um, something else I do quite a lot. 
um, if students are doing a text, if they're reading an authentic text, maybe from a, an American newspaper, yeah, I might add in a little word bank at the bottom. OK, just, you know, to make the, the process a little easier. If there are words I know for sure they won't know, pop it in a word bank and that will help them um, as they read the text. All right. Um, so it could also be, everyone, that um, we can't find anything suitable. Yeah, there is nothing that really grabs us. So we decide, OK, let's do it. Let's I'm going to create my own resource. I'm going to go it alone and make my own worksheet or write my own text or make my own video. OK, um, everything we said before still applies. Yeah, there are still lots of things to consider, like the demographics. OK, what would be suitable for the age, for the culture, OK, um, for their interests, their needs? Um, what are my aims and objectives? You know, as always, we've got to have our aims and objectives clear from the start um, or else our, our material will go nowhere. Yeah, it will achieve nothing if we don't know what we want it to achieve. Um, what topic yeah, do you want to explore or what topic do you think your students would be interested in? Um, what skill do you want to practice? Yeah. Do you want it to be a reading lesson or do you want it to be a listening lesson or um, do you just want prompts for a speaking task? Yeah, you know, we've got to have this clear in our mind before we before we start creating. Um, also, language grading. Again, um, so much of teaching just comes down to language grading. Um, we've got to use the words and the grammatical structures that are suitable for the students that we're teaching. OK, um, also, it's really important to bear in mind safety considerations. OK, um, you know, we don't want to expose our students to anything that might, you know, potentially harm them in any way. Yeah. You know, it goes without saying we've got to be really careful with our material and, you know, we've got to be aware of sensitivities. OK. Um, you know, in this case, it might be so much of a physical safety thing, but more of a, an emotional safety thing. OK, um, so we've always got to be really, really mindful of that. OK, um, some other things that we can think about um, could be learning styles. Yeah. So does my material cater? Um, for the visual learners, yeah, or does it also cater for the auditory learners or the kinesthetic learners? Okay, um, what type of technology is required? And as we said, what is my backup <laughs> if the technology fails me? Okay, so you're probably starting to see now a lot of the same considerations come up time and time again. Yeah, um, if you do go down the route of creating your own resources. Um, you know, some, some practical things to consider it might be font type and size. Yeah, so you want your, your material to look nice, okay? Um, more importantly, it needs to be accessible for all students, okay? So, you know, don't have the tiny little font, yeah? Um, we've got to make it big, we've got to make it clear. Um, you know, we want to leave spacing between our lines. Um, we want it to look visually appealing okay because nothing scares students or indeed i think people in general um more than just getting like a solid block of text it's just like ah oh, what do i do here where do i even start okay so make sure everything looks good is well spaced out and is logically presented um when it comes to choosing your images again back to the back to the point of you know, make sure you're using something that has a Creative Commons license. OK, you don't want to violate copyright. Um, you might even go down the route of using your own photos. You know, I've done that tons of times. Um, you know, if you can't find anything suitable out there, just take your own picture. Um, think carefully about the suitability of visuals. Yeah, make sure that they're age appropriate. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of new teachers in the past using um, very childish material for an adults group. 
yeah, like they use a handout that was, you know, blatantly designed for younger learners. Um, try to avoid that because, you know, adults will find it super patronizing. Um, the same goes for teenagers. Yeah, like using images um, that were clearly meant for young kids with teenagers never goes down well. <laughs> so make sure that the images you're using are age appropriate. Okay. And yeah, again, back to your, your own time. Okay. The most valuable resource of all. Um, consider, um, are you spending too much time creating something that will only last for a short um, part of the class? Okay. You know, make sure that you're investing your time into something that will buy you more time in the classroom. All right. So just to finish up before we jump into your questions, um, here is a list of some really good websites for teaching resources. OK, um, so as you know, um, the TEFL Academy has a blog. Um, you can often find some some really, really great teaching ideas there. OK, so check out our website, our blog um, for inspiration. Um, the British Council is an amazing resource. Um, if you just Google British Council um, ESL or EFL, okay, you will find an absolute wealth of material um, for kids, for teenagers, for adults, for grammar, for vocab, for skills. Yeah, oh, an incredible resource. Um, English First um, is another um, teaching organization that tend to have really good resources. Okay, so again, Google English First teaching resources, um, you'll find a lot. Um, another really nice site is ESL Lounge. Okay, um, one of my very favorite websites, um, if you ever find yourself teaching um, older teenagers or adults, is TED Ed. Um, so it's a special offshoot um, of TED Talks. Okay, um, so TED Ed uses TED Talks, but also supplies lots of material um, to go alongside those TED Talks to use with your with your students. Um, I love TED Ed. I'm such a fan. Um, ESL Galaxy um, is another good resource. And, you know, if you can't find anything you want, just use Google search. Um, so um, if, for example, I'm doing future continuous with my intermediate adults tomorrow, um, I might just type in future continuous intermediate adults EFL or ESL. OK, and uh, yeah, you'll find a lot for, you know, you can pick through all of the results and find something you like. All right. Um, so all in all, then, I guess um, all that's left to say is that once you have created your resource or adapted your resource, yeah, um, proofread <laughs> okay this can never be overstated yeah how important it is um, so proofread your material make sure that it relates to your aims and objectives um, make sure that it's doing something like it's giving you some information like um, have students understood um, whatever it is they've done or are you going for more summative effects uh, assessment like are you just looking at what students can do in general yeah um, so is it like focused on one thing or is it just more general okay um, when you do create your own material you know test it by having your students do it okay you know that's really the true the true test okay have them do it and if it went well awesome if it didn't go well you know make your tweaks and use it again OK, um, you know, it's all a very, a very, um, it's all very much a learning process. OK, unfortunately, we don't often know how effective something is until we teach it. <laughs> OK, but then we can make informed changes. All right. Oh, OK. I feel like I've been talking for a long time, everybody. Um, it is now over to you all. Um, if you have any questions, um, related to creating or adapting material, please pop them in the chat box. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to um, type in some of the really nice websites that I use for the copyright free images. All right. 
um, that will give you a moment to think of your questions and yeah it will also give you a, a nice bank of websites to use or you can be safe in the knowledge that you're not violating copyright somewhere okay uh, pop two or three of them in the chat okay so yeah those oops I forgot the key from the last one picks a bay that should be I'll write it in again okay all right so let's go then let's take a look back through our questions um oh massachusetts canary islands oh my goodness how lovely from colombia from chile i bienvenidos todos uh, from the lebanon poland oh man this is blowing my mind i don't think we've ever had such a geographical spread before i love this um oh happy birthday sufian thank you for spending it with us all right so Johan, you are first in with the question. Let's look. Um, so will a backup plan for an online class include forwarding a presentation, worksheets and other relevant materials to students before a training session starts? Um, yeah, that's a really good idea, Johan. Um, I think that's a great plan. Um, so you can forward them the material in advance. Um, be aware though that some students in their eagerness might look at everything in advance too. So sometimes it can take away the element of surprise <laughs> from your lesson. Um, so you can absolutely send it to them. Um, if you're happy for them to see it all beforehand, that's not a problem. Okay. If you don't want them to look at it in advance, you know, maybe write a note um, on the file saying, please don't look before class. Okay. But yeah, I really like that idea. Um, another thing you can do is try to put stuff on slides because maybe, you know, the, I've had some issues where I can't send links, yeah, or the links aren't delivering, but students can still see slides, okay? Um, so, you know, you can put some stuff on slides as well, Put try to put your activities or the gist of your activities on a slide. So even if they can't access the link, for whatever reason, they can still see um, what you want them to do. All right, thanks, Johan, good question. Um, so, Kathy, on visuals, just to consider it, not all cartoons are meant for children either. Oh, true story, Kathy, absolutely. Yeah, again, it, it comes back to, you know, s inspecting everything in advance. Yeah, because, yeah, there can be some nasty surprises out there for sure. Um, yeah, thanks for that. That's a great point. All right. So we have our birthday person, uh, Sufian. In terms of resources, how would you go about providing them for educationally challenged or students with impairment disabilities? Mm, yeah, good question, Sufian. Um, you know, you should know about this in advance. Okay. Um, you know, you should... It would be very rare that you would turn up to class and, you know, then find out that you had students with a certain, you know, impairment or um, certain um, special educational needs. Um, so in advance, you know, you would know this when preparing your materials. So, you know, you could hopefully overcome, um, you know, you could adapt your material um, to suit your students, um, whether it's a visual thing, Okay, whether it's, you know, making the font a lot bigger um, or, you know, if you're using a video or audio, trying to make sure that, it, it you know, it's not too hectic. Yeah, that it's not going to upset some students um, by being too loud, too flashy, etc. Um, so, you know, before you start, before you teach your class, you should be aware of your students' needs. Um, if you're working in a private language school, for example, you know, they would tell you all of this in advance. Or if you're picking up, um, I was going to say if you're picking up students yourself, which <laughs> which uh, sounds a bit dodgy, but if you're finding your own students, rather, um, you know, before you start teaching them, you know, make sure to ask them, like, is there anything here that 
you know, you need to tell me about your circumstances so that I can best meet your needs. Um, but yeah, okay. Thank you, Sufian. Nice question. Um, preparation, really. Preparation is key. Yeah, forewarned is forearmed. Okay. Um, so hi there, Mix Wolf. Uh, when it comes to teach, when it comes to online teaching, what would you say we should avoid or be careful of in terms of material? Um, well, I think pretty much what you should be careful of in terms of face-to-face -face classes too. Okay, um, you know we want to stay away from potentially offensive stuff. Okay, um, especially when we don't know our students very well. Um, so things like politics. Yeah, we, we don't want to go in with politics or, you know, any reference to alcohol um, because, you know, that might be culturally in, insensitive. We don't want to mention drugs, okay, narcotics. Um, we want to steer clear of any type of sexual um, talk or content, okay? Um, it can be a really good idea to steer clear of religion, yeah? Um, all of the the isms, yeah, you know, we don't want to go in with racism, sexism, okay. Um, so you know, just using using common sense, right? We don't want to go into we don't want to go in with really divisive polemic topics, okay? Because we never know, um, you know, what our students' um, backgrounds are, what their thoughts are on these things. Um, you know, it's true that when you've been with a group for a long time, maybe, and, you know, you know them and they know you, you know, then you can maybe get a little bit more, um, a little bit more polemic with your topics. Um, but, you know, always ask them in advance. Like I was thinking next week um, that we could do um, a lesson on the recent elections. Yeah. In Brazil, for example. Um, do you have a, does anyone have a problem with that? Does everyone feel comfortable with that? Okay, so, you know, you can maybe introduce these topics um, a little more when you know your class well, but if you don't, steer clear. Okay, um, so yeah, avoid material about those polemic topics. Um, apart from that, I would say just make sure that your materials look nice. You know, don't go in with really, really small font or really cramped pages. Yeah, just make sure it looks good and it looks inviting. Um, so yeah, that's that's what occurs to me at the moment, Mixwolf. If I think of more, I'll come back to it. Okay, thank you for your question. Um, okay, let's have a look. So Blue, you say I use Pixabay all the time. Yeah, me too. I love it. I'm a big fan. Good. So yeah, everybody get on Pixabay. It's really good for the copyright free images. Okay, uh, Geraldine, you mentioned a website to create interactive worksheets. Yes, Geraldine, I did. How did I forget? Thank you so much for reminding me. Um, so the one I use a lot is called Teacher Made. Okay, um, I'm just gonna Google. I can't remember off the top of my head if it's a .com or .org. So I'll tell you, I always get my comms and orgs and bizzes <laughs> all mixed up. Um, teacher made. Do, 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 dot. Oh, yeah. So it's a dot com. Okay. Um, so teachermade.com is amazing. Um, because as I said, it can turn any static worksheet or activity into you know a really fun um, interactive one where students can drag and drop match um, you know they can type in um, words etc um, teacher made is great um, I think you can get like a 30-day free trial and after that it does move into a subscription um, but you know I think it's only like six dollars six dollars a month or something which would be, I think, like I paid about four or five euros a month, I think. Um, but well worth it. Like if you're doing online teaching, oh, I could not recommend it more. It's awesome. Um, so yeah, thank you, Geraldine, for reminding me and teachermade.com. All right. Um, so 
Hi, Sri Lakshmi from India. Welcome. A really informative session. Oh, I'm glad. Thank you. And I have a question. Is it okay to use film references? Um, I would say so, Sri Lakshmi. Um, we've got to be careful though that the film references we're using will mean something to our students. Okay. Um, like, you know, if you're teaching um, teenagers, for example, you know, if you mention classic old films like Gone with the Wind or Citizen Kane, you know, it might not mean much to them. You know, well, it might too, you know, who knows what our students know, but typically try to reference things that they will know about, okay? Things that are within their frame of reference. All right, um, but yeah, absolutely. You know, we use, I well, I use film all the time, whether it's just like a quote or soundtracks or, you know, just watch a clip. Um, yeah, absolutely. Films are great for this. All right. So thank you very much, Sri Lakshmi. Welcome. Um, all right. So, hey, Mena, welcome. Good to see you. Um, if I use a video from uh, TED Ed, would this video be considered authentic material or not? Um, well, it depends, Mena. If the video was originally delivered in English, um, then yeah, absolutely, it's authentic material. Um, because if you think about TED Talks, you know, they're not delivered at learners of English, you know, they're just delivered at uh, speakers of English. Yeah. Um, so yeah, TED Talks are definitely authentic as long as they were, you know, originally delivered in English for an English speaking audience. All right, thank you, Mena. It's always good to check these things. Um, so you, you have you, <laughs> fun username. Um, so do you use songs with adults? I wonder about working through a song at appropriate levels of vocabulary, cultural awareness, choosing music in this work with all age groups. Um, yeah, I would say so. Um, I've certainly used songs um, with all age levels. Um, I think when it comes to um, using songs and indeed any type of authentic material, you know, really we're not grading the material because it's authentic. Um, instead, we're grading the task, okay? Um, so, you know, if we want to use a song and we want to turn it into a gap fill, okay, maybe with lower level students, we will just like remove maybe really common nouns, yeah, or really easy adjectives, okay, Whether, whereas if we were doing, you know, a song with higher level, we might, you know, remove the grammatical structures or the more complex idioms, okay, um, so, you know, you can absolutely use songs with all ages, just, you know, grade the task um, according to the level. Um, in terms of cultural awareness, yeah, it's so important, as we said, to just um, review the material really carefully. Just make sure it doesn't contain any swear words or any, you know, kind of graphic um, language, yeah, or that it doesn't talk about topics that or well, it doesn't sing about topics that aren't suitable for your age group, culture, etc. Um, but yeah, absolutely, use songs. Students love them. Uh, songs are like the best things, some of the best things we can do. All right, so thank you. Good question. All right. So, hi, Kate. Um, could you be more specific about visual font size spacing? Um, well, Kate, just you know as long as your 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 material doesn't look really cramped yeah and as long as it doesn't cause hardship to the reader like we don't want them squinting or like holding the the page up to their nose okay you know we don't want like continuous blocks of text um you know you can use you know whatever font size you want yeah or whatever font and um, maybe not maybe not the um Oh, I can't remember the name, but you know the one that looks like cursive handwriting. Um, it can be like the copper plate. Okay, we typically don't want to use anything too ornate like that because, you know, it, our students are already having um, to make a lot of effort to understand what's written. We don't want them to also have to decipher um, some crazy fonts. Okay, so, you know, as long as it your worksheet or your material looks, you know, clear, 
big enough um, to read without strain, yeah, and nicely laid out, you know, you'll be doing fine, okay? Um, if you ever find yourself looking at your worksheet and thinking, ooh, is that font too small? Yeah, have I crammed too much on one page? You probably have, okay? Because if it's triggering that um, instinct in you, yeah, we can like double, triple that instinct um, in our students, you know, whose first language is not English. Okay, um, so yeah, just make sure it looks nice, easy to follow, big enough, clear enough. All right, thank you, Kate. All right. Um, so, hi, Costa, Wendy. That's a really fun name. Um, are you in Spain? Um, I used to live on the Costa del Sol for, oh, many years. So, yeah. Anyway, um, let's take a look at your question. Um, do schools hiring EFL teachers generally provide the curriculum for the grade level and or resources? Oh, great question, Costa, Wendy. Um, I presume your name is Wendy. Um, yeah, typically. You know, um, I know when I was looking for work, when I started teaching, um, you know, any interview I had with a language school, my very first question would always be, um, do you have a curriculum? Do you have a course book? And do you have access to resources? OK. And if the school said, no, you can make up your own stuff. Yeah, I would run a mile. OK. Um, believe me, you do not want to be in the position where you're responsible for sourcing all of your own materials for every class, okay, because that's a nightmare. Um, so always make sure that if you are working for an online, or online, no, if you are working for a private language school, that they do have a curriculum, they do have a course book, and they do have access to material. Um, because once you have your material and your course book, yeah, that is like the bulk of everything covered. Um, so then you just need to go find the fun material that you want to add in, okay? Or the supplementary material that you want to add in, okay? Um, but yeah, try not to put yourself in the position where you're expected to decide what you're going to do in every single class. Um, you know, it's a bit different perhaps if you're teaching online as a freelancer or, you know, if you're just finding your own students, um, then, you know, you will be responsible for making all your own material. And, you know, that's fine. Just make sure that you um, find out from your students, yeah, exactly what they want and what they expect from the lesson. Um, you know, do they want loads of speaking? Do they want loads of listening practice? Um, yeah, I would say, yeah, I would say that's the way to go, Wendy. Um, always try to work for a school that has a, a curriculum, a course book and access to resource books. Um, yeah, that'll save you a lot of heartache. And then you just get to focus on, on finding the fun supplementary stuff to do. All right. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah. Next well. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, gosh, I'm going to blush. Um, okay. Let's see. Kate, so how do you deal with binary gender normative images? Women wear dresses and cook and care for babies. Um, yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, Kate, there, there's a lot of that still out there. Um, again, it just comes back um, to, you know, selecting material that you feel comfortable with and that your class will feel comfortable with. OK. Um, if it's in a textbook or whatever, you know, as you know, a lot of textbooks, they will have certain stereotypes like this. Um, you know, you can just kind of brush it off and say, oh, OK, well, of course, we know that, you know, nowadays, you know, in real life, things are very different. But OK, let's let's work with this picture. OK. Or you might say, you know what? I looked at this picture and I didn't like it. So here's a picture we're going to use instead. OK. So, you know, you can kind of qualify and use or qualify and and you know reject use something different okay um you'll probably find yourself having to do a lot of that um depending on you know the age group you're teaching the culture you're teaching etc all right thank you kate um, let's see 
Okay, Mixwolf, let's take a look at your question. Um, in your experience, when starting a course with a new group, what would you say is the best teaching activities or ways to use as an icebreaker and to introduce your course? Mm, lovely question. Well, Mixwolf, definitely, definitely, definitely spend the first lesson um, just getting to know your students. Yeah, just finding out about them, letting them know about you, Yeah, letting them get to know you. Um, you know, you've got to you've got to bring them into your world and you've got to show them that you're willing and that you're interested in, you know, finding out about them, not as students, but as people. OK, um, so I used to do um, I haven't taught a new group in a really long time, actually. But before my first activity was always um, an activity called guess. Um, so up on the board, I would write two numbers two names and two places that were somehow important to me and si significant in my life, okay? So for example, I might put the name um, Ronan, yeah. So first of all, students would ask me, is it a, a um, you know, are we talking about a man or a woman here? Yeah, because they wouldn't know the name Ronan and I would say a man. So then they would have to guess, who is he in my life? So they would ask things like, is he your father? Is he your brother? Is he your boyfriend? Is he your husband? Okay. And, you know, along the way, I would say, oh, no, he's not my father. My father's name is James. Okay. He was a teacher. Yeah. So, you know, kind of adding in snippets. And then they might say, oh, is Ronan your husband? And I'd say, yeah, yeah, he is. Um, what would you like to ask me about him? So they might ask things like, oh, what does he do? Um how long have you been married, etc. Um, so, you know, any activity like that, just to open up the lines of activity, of, of the lines of communication. Yeah. You know, let them get to know you. And then when I'd done that activity, they would do the activity. Okay. And, you know, I would get to ask them tons of questions. And yeah, any activity like that, Maxwell, just get to know them. You know, um, it's really interesting. Of course, we want to know about our students. You know, we're going to spend loads of time together. Okay, we are genu genuinely interested in them as people rather than student, just as students. Um, so yeah, definitely lots of get to know you activities. All right. Um, so let's see, what other questions do we have? Um, okay, Kate, you're asking about um, how to use um, a computer or how to use resources. Um, really, Kate, trial and error, okay, practice. Um, for Canva, for example, just go to YouTube and type in beginner's tutorial for Canva, okay, and watch it. Um, everything I learned about computers, I've learned from YouTube, okay? So, you know, just, just go get onto YouTube and put in, like, um, making links for beginners, yeah, Canva for beginners, um, video clips for beginners, okay? And you've got to play around with it all. Um, and practice makes perfect. And YouTube tutorials. <laughs> all right. Um, I know a lot of um, local community centers. You know, I'm not sure what country you're in, but check out if your local community center um, does computer courses for beginners. OK, um, I know in Ireland you can you can go along and do them for free pretty much. Okay, so, you know, or local libraries are really good for, for computer skills. So, you know, get out there and inquire, see if there's any course you can get involved in. Um, but yeah, really practice makes perfect. All right, good. Um, so you have you really helpful. Ah, oh, good, yeah, thank you so much. I'm glad, I'm glad I helped. Um, so yeah, that's like my, my motto, okay? Don't grade the text, grade the task. All right, very good. So let's see. Oh, guys, I see we have more questions, but we're out of time. No. Oh, I'm really sorry, everyone. Um, if I don't get time, it looks like I'm going to have to leave out a couple of questions um, because our time is up. Um, so let's see. Um, oops, yeah. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, it's a great icebreaker game for sure. Um, I'm a big fan of the guess. 
um, just yeah, any time spent getting to know your students is, is time well spent. Okay, so everyone, again, apologies if I didn't get to your questions. Um, there were so many amazing questions. Um, hopefully, um, you'll have taken a lot from, um, from our session on adapting and, and creating resources. Um, don't be afraid of it, you know, jump in and do it. Okay, don't be afraid. That's the main thing. Everything won't always be perfect in the beginning, but yeah, you know, practice, practice will get you there. All right. So everyone, um, I'm going to sign off now. But um, before I go, I am going to post a link to our survey in the chat box. Um, it would be really, really helpful for us um, if you could spend a minute or two just completing the survey. Um, because, you know, as ever, teachers are just a, a constant work in, process, in progress. Okay. Even after 20 years of this, I am in constant development. <laughs> so it would be really great if you could fill in our survey and tell us how you think we did. All right. So everyone have a wonderful rest of day. Okay. Rest of weekend. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. All right, everyone. Bye. Thank you for coming.